Welcome back to A New Way to Museum. I am your host for the day, Curtis Schmidt, the Zoological Collections Manager here at the museum. What I'm gonna talk to you today about is probably my favorite subject, rattlesnakes, venomous snakes. I absolutely love them, absolutely adore them. If you've been to our museum in the last, I wanna say nine years, you've probably seen our rattlesnake exhibit. Uh, that I had a big part of, of creating. And I get to mess with these things all the time. But what I'm gonna do today is just talk a little bit about the basic biology of these things. And then I'm gonna focus a lot on myths, uh, misconceptions about these things, about the rattlesnakes. So hopefully it clears up some of the things that are just not true. One of the first things that I wanna show you is a skeleton of a rattlesnake. So this is a small one. And you'll notice, and this is true with most snakes, they don't have a whole lot of bones. They've got vertebrae, they've got ribs, and then they've got a skull. A uh, skull is made up of a handful of bones that, you, that are very loosely attaching to each other. So actually, one of the most fascinating and, and interesting trivia subjects uh, is what makes a snake? It's a really good question. A snake is an animal that has 120 or more precloacal vertebrae. So the cloaca, what I mean by precloacal, the cloaca is where the snake goes to the bathroom. Um, the actual definition is a shared orifice between the excretory system and the reproductive system. So basically where the tail starts is the cloaca. So 120 or more vertebra from the head to the cloaca. There's no lizards that have that many. There's no other animals on the planet that have 120 or more. So that's what makes a snake a snake. Um, an interesting thing, um, when snakes feed, on a variety of different things. You know, they digest pretty much everything but fur on mice, feathers on birds, things like that. Um, but they digest bones, and they digest teeth. But one of the more fascinating things is, and I don't have a really good answer to this question, is that they cannot digest their own fangs. Fangs are, are loosely attached. They're breaking off all the time. And just like sharks, there's replacement fangs waiting to come in as soon as the, the typical fang, the normal fang, breaks off. So say the animal is swallowing a mouse, the fang breaks off, it swallows the fang, the other fang, the replacement, will go ahead and pop into its place. But they don't digest their fangs, so they come out in the poop, which is really, really interesting to me. So what I've got here is a vial of rattlesnake fangs that I've collected from snake poop. Really, really interesting. There's gotta be something in the enamel that they cannot digest. So what makes a rattlesnake a rattlesnake? That's a good question. They have rattles, but they don't all have rattles. The reason why is because they break. They're very, very fragile and they break off. So this is a typical rattle string from a, a good-sized rattlesnake. Uh, a lot of people think, and one of the main myths that I'm gonna talk about is that you can age a rattlesnake by counting the number of segments on its string. That's not true at all. Um, for one thing, as I mentioned just a minute ago, they are very fragile and they break all the time. So you don't know how many it originally had. But also, every single time the snake sheds its skin is when it adds another segment to its rattle string. So that can be anywhere from three to five or six times a year, depending on how fast the snake's growing. So you can't do that. There are mathematical formulas for certain species that can get you in the ballpark by measuring how many there are and how wide they are and how much taper there is to the rattle, but I'm not gonna get into that. Just know that you cannot age a snake by counting the number of rattles on its string. So what I've got here, this is a complete rattle from a relatively young snake. 
So you can see it's got a nice taper to it, so it's growing rather rapidly. It's got the button still attached to the very end, so a snake is actually born with the button, but it's been broken off. So that's what a complete intact rattle looks like. But again, that's typically only for the, for the first two or three years of the snake being alive do they remain intact. Most of the ones that you see and find are like this. They're just fragments of rattles. That can still make a good amount of noise. But it's just fragments of a rattle because they are brittle, they break a lot, made of the same materials as our fingernails. So it's keratin and it's very thin. And each of the segments loosely interlocks with all the other ones. So hopefully you can see what's going on there. And one of the things that's fascinating, I can pick up a big rattle like this and I can shake the crap out of it as fast as I can shake. That's not what a rattlesnake typically sounds like because they can vibrate their tail so much faster than I can. And what's going on is in a typical rattle string about this size right here, there's over a thousand points of contact per second when they're rattling their rattle. So if you think about that, that's what's creating that, that really neat buzz that you hear when they're really agitated and really warning you that they're a venomous snake. And that's actually what these things are for. It's just a warning. That's how they developed the rattles, the rattlesnakes. It's a warning to potential predators, to potential um, hoof stock like cattle or bison that live in these areas that, hey, I'm here, don't step on me, or I'm dangerous, you don't want to eat me, or I may end up killing you. Which brings me to another myth. So I'm going to jump right into the myths now real quick. Um, a lot of people think that venom became what it is for protection of the snake, self-defense, basically, which is not true at all. Um, we have another one of these videos where we actually show the snake using its venom for what it was, what it was evolved for, and that's for feeding. So basically, if there's a bull snake or some other type of non-venomous snake, like constrictors, you're thinking of a boa constrictor or something like that, or a bull snake, when they get a rat, they have to bite the rat, they have to wrap up on the rat. Well, that rat's going to want to defend itself. Uh, and a rat can inflict some serious damage to a snake that it's trying to kill. So it can bite it, it can chew it. Um, venomous snakes don't have to deal with that because they took it to the next evolutionary step. All they have to do is bite it, quickly inject the venom, which happens in a fraction of a second, and immediately let go. Then the prey wanders off and dies with no self-defense. It, it's not fighting back. So the snake doesn't have to worry about getting injured by its prey. So that is what it's for. And also, while the prey is wandering off and dying, the venom starts working internally on the insides of the, the prey and digesting it from the inside out. So before the snake even tracks it down, and swallows it, it's already getting digested. So it's a very efficient and effective feeding mechanism is what the venom evolved for. It just so happens that it also works very well for self-defense, much to the dismay of humans, which can take a defensive bite from one of these things and it's not gonna end well. Usually isn't gonna kill you, but that tissue destruction that evolved to, to uh, digest the tissue is going to do the same thing to you that it does to the mouse. So anyway, so that's what venom is for. Um, a lot of people also actually think that young snakes, or baby snakes, baby rattlesnakes are more dangerous and more venomous than the adults are. That is simply not true. Um, when you're considering how deadly and how toxic a snake is, you have to think about two different things. How relatively toxic the venom is and how much of that venom it delivers to you if it bites you. 
So with that in mind, thinking about that, would you rather get bit by a really big snake or a really small snake? I would take the small snake every time because the venom that it can deliver is not going to be near as much as the big snake. Now there are certain instances where the baby snakes will eat different things than the adults, so they have a little different uh, cocktail of venom. So basically the components of the venom are a little different because again, they're eating different things. It's evolved to help them digest their prey and kill their prey. So there's dietary shifts from the baby to the adult and the venom can shift as well. So that could either mean it's gonna be a little more toxic, but it could also mean it's gonna be a little less toxic. It just depends on the prey and what that venom is, is doing to the prey to be more or less toxic to humans. So anyway, that's a long way of saying um, that is simply not true to say that the, the young snakes, the baby snakes are more dangerous than the adults are. Not true at all. I would much rather take a bite from a baby snake. Uh, in this area, I really enjoy this myth that the prairie rattlesnakes will hybridize with the bull snakes in the area to make bull rattlers, which are much more dangerous. They, they, they have the attitude of a bull snake and the venom of a rattlesnake. That is simply not true. Um, that's one of those cases where we have to even, just looking at the reproductive biology of those two, the pit vipers, which rattlesnakes are, have live young, and bull snakes lay eggs. So it's not even physically possible for that to happen. So that myth is out there, and it's, it's actually really funny. I really enjoy getting that one, but know that it absolutely cannot happen. Um, kind of along those same lines, a lot of people think if you have bull snakes around, they're wonderful to have because they will keep rattlesnakes away. Um, that is a myth that I typically don't try to correct people on because they're not going to kill the bull snakes. They like to have the bull snakes around. I don't want people killing any snakes. So if me telling them that them thinking that is wrong, I don't want to do that because I don't want the bull snakes to die as well. But the snakes, and it doesn't have to be bull snakes, um, rattlesnakes coexist with a, a wide variety of snakes. They don't chase each other off. Um, they occasionally can compete for food resources if they're scarce and they're not really available. But several snakes can live in, in, a, in an area and not bother one another one bit. So it's just simply not true that bull snakes will keep rattlesnakes away, unfortunately. Um, a big one that I hear from a lot of people is that snakes chase people. And lots of people just swear that that's true. Snakes will chase people. They don't chase people. Um, but what they do is if you think about a snake and where it lives, snakes are just like people. They have their habitat. They have their home. They know their home very, very well. And if you startle a snake while it's out looking for a meal or just looking for a mate or something like that, and you come between it and its only known source of refuge, so a hole in the ground that it would escape predators with, it's going to come at you because it's not trying to get you, it's trying to get behind you. So you stepped in the way between it and its safety, basically. So there are behaviors that can appear like snakes are chasing people, but they're not. They're terrified of people, uh, just like they're terrified of just about anything that's bigger than them. They want to get away. So what, whatever appears like they're chasing you um, is typically them trying to get away as, as fast as they possibly can. So the last thing I want to show you, getting away from um, myths, I just want to show you some of the differences between the pit vipers, the venomous snakes, and the majority of the non-venomous snakes. I don't, don't know how well you can see this, but venomous snakes in this area, the pit vipers, have what we call keeled scales, where every single one of the scales has a ridge running down the middle of it. And the reason why is because when they lay coiled, they're not shiny because of that. It breaks up the light. 
So with, with those keeled scales like that, it makes them blend into their surroundings much, much better. The other extreme of that are the non-venomous snakes. This is a king snake that have smooth scales. So if you look at those scales up close, and hopefully you can see it, they're just smooth. There's no keels. They're very shiny. Uh, so these guys rely more on getting away than laying still and not being noticed. So that's the smooth scale versus the keeled scales. And with that, uh, I'm going to say over and out for the day, and we'll catch you guys next time. Thanks for joining us in the New Way to Museum with the Sternberg Museum of Natural History. If you enjoyed this video, like it and subscribe to our channel. Hit the bell for notifications when we release a new video. Support us on Patreon for early access and exclusive content. You can also follow us on all our social media. Links are found in the description. Thanks for watching and follow your curiosity to new discoveries.